You know, I've heard a lot of experts say that fear isn't real. That is such a bunch of baloney. Fear is so real. In fact, there are probably things that you're afraid of doing right now in your life, in your relationships, at work. And the fact that you're afraid, that's robbing you of all of the experiences that you want to have in your life. I mean, if you're afraid to fly, that's going to limit your ability to travel and see the world or go visit friends. If you're afraid of public speaking, that's going to really limit your ability to express yourself and share your ideas. If you're afraid of talking to your boss or asking for a raise, that directly impacts how much money you make. Or what if you are dreaming of starting a business or you've already started a new business, but you're afraid to talk to people and you're afraid to share your business with people? I mean, fear is something that stops us all. And that's why I'm here to talk to you because it doesn't have to. Fear is real, but I am going to share a secret weapon that I have used for years to beat every single fear that used to stop me. Now, first, before we get into this secret weapon, I just want to cover a few facts about fear, what it is, what it isn't, and some things that you may not know about fear. So first thing, fear is a physical state in your body that is exactly the same as excitement. Let me say that again. Fear and excitement are the exact same physical state. Your heart races. You might sweat a little bit. You might feel tightening in your chest. You might feel a pit in your stomach. Uh, you have a surge of cortisol. It's basically the way that your body goes into a hyper aware state because it's readying for action. Now, what's the difference between fear and excitement? Really simple. The only difference between fear and excitement is what your brain is doing as your body is all agitated. If you're excited, your brain's going, oh, wow, this is going to be so cool to ride this roller coaster. If you're afraid, your brain's going, oh, uh, uh, no way. There's no way I'm doing that. This is dangerous. Get out of there. Don't do that. It's saying something different. So what's critical about understanding this is that we're going to use the fact that your mind is either working for you for excitement or against you with fear to your advantage. And I'll tell you about it in just a minute, how you're going to do that. Second thing I want you to understand is that you may have heard the advice, feel the fear and do it anyway. You may have heard the advice, oh, just try to calm down. Think positive thoughts. It doesn't work, does it? And there's a reason why it doesn't work. So let's go back to fact number one. When you're afraid, your body's in a state of arousal and agitation and your heart is racing and you're all like amped up and you're hyper aware of what's going on and you're freaking out a little bit. What is it like when you're calm? <sighs> you just kind of chill, right? You got like this low arousal state. Very, very difficult to go from a state of agitation of being all jacked up and excited and weirded out and, uh, to a kind of state. It doesn't work. It's like trying to stop a train by throwing a boulder on the tracks. It's going to make the train jump off the tracks. It's going to cause a disaster. In fact, they've proven in research that when you try to ignore your fears, it actually makes them worse. And they've also proven in research that positive thinking alone also can make your fears work worse. So what do you do? What do you do when you're about to go talk to your boss and you feel afraid? What do you do when you have to get on a plane and you're actually terrified of flying? What do you do if you got to give a presentation and you are afraid of public speaking? Here's what you're going to do. You're going to use a strategy, the same one that I use, that has helped me beat every single fear and turned me into somebody that is terrific when it comes to a high stress situation. This is how you do it. You're going to use my five second rule in combination with what I call an anchor thought. And that is going to reframe what your mind is doing so that your mind goes from feeling agitation and making you afraid to reframing it from agitation to excitement. It works like magic. Now I have used this technique for years, literally for years. And one of the ways that I want to introduce you to it is I want to take you backstage. I want to take you backstage to a speech that I delivered this year. And what you're going to see is you're going to see me 
behind, you know, the major set. I'm about to walk out. You can kind of hear the crowd roaring. My introductory video is playing. My body is in a state of arousal. I am literally, my heart is racing. My arms are sweating. Like, it's, like you're going to see this. I'm going to tell you about it. And you're going to watch me use this same technique I'm going to teach you to reframe my nerves into excitement. Check this out. All right, I'm about to go on stage. There are 7,000 people out there. And it's so exciting because what they don't know is they're about to learn the five second rule and their lives will never be the same again. Now, I gotta tell you, my heart is racing. Um, my armpits are sweating. I have the exact same physiological feeling as when I'm afraid, but I'm not afraid. I'm excited. Excitement and fear is the exact same thing in your body. It's just what your brain calls it. Here's a trick that's proven by science that I use every time I speak. When I start to sweat, when I start to have butterflies, when I start to have my heart race, I say, I'm excited. I'm excited to get out there. I'm excited to talk to these people. I'm excited to share the five second rule. And what that does is it sends a message to my brain that tells my brain why my body's all agitated and excited. And that way, I don't feel afraid. Remember, excitement and fear, exact same thing in your body. The only difference is what your brain calls it. Go get them. Now, I want to give you one more example, just to make sure that you really get how you can use this. So a lot of you have written to me about your fear of flying. And I can really relate to that fear because I used to have the exact same fear. But I use this same strategy to conquer it. Here's how you're going to do it. So first things first, if you've got to do something that really makes you nervous or that you're afraid to do, before you're about to do it, come up with an anchor thought. What's an anchor thought? Well, an anchor thought is something that's going to anchor you so that you don't escalate any situation into a full-blown panic attack or into a situation where you screw things up. It's a way for you to anchor yourself so you maintain control over what you're thinking and how you behave. So here's an example with flying. It's important when you're creating an anchor thought to pick something that is in the proper context of what you're afraid to do. So for flying, pick an anchor thought that has to do with the trip that you're taking. So if I'm boarding a plane to fly back home to Michigan, an anchor thought might be a picture in my mind of my mom and I walking on the shores of Lake Michigan where I grew up. That's a thought that makes me happy, it makes me excited, and it's also related to the trip that I'm taking. If you have a conversation that you need to have with your boss, pick an anchor thought about how you feel after having that conversation. Maybe it's you picking up the phone and calling somebody that you, you love and saying, oh my gosh, it went so well. Or you, know, you walking out of the meeting and feeling like, yeah, I survived that conversation. I feel pretty good about myself. So now that you have your anchor thought, you're ready to beat the fear. I want to tell you a little bit about the science. So there's this famous neuroscientist called Antonio Damasio, and he did a really interesting study where he discovered that our body senses fear before our mind even realizes it. And when fear or danger, speaking to your boss, calling a prospect, going to the gym when you're not proud of the way that you look. Um, and you know, it's not fear like terror. It's more that low grade agitation in your body. I felt it yesterday because I went to a boot camp class yesterday and I'm not in good shape and I don't do boot camp classes and Kendall and I are staying at this hotel where, holy cow, everybody seems like there's some sort of professional weightlifter or Instagram model. And so it was really intimidating and I could feel that agitation in my body. That's the kind of fear I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the paralysis fear your life is threatened and you really are in a life or death situation. I'm talking about the low grade agitation that is um, there when you're about to do something that makes you feel a little uncomfortable. So when fear or danger is sensed in the body, your body begins a stress response before your mind even catches up. And if you want to take control of your life, you got to take control of that physical state. And it starts with catching these moments, everyone, when you um, start to feel it, okay? And so for some of you, it may be a pit in the stomach. For some of you, it may be tightening in the chest. For Heather, who was one of the people I coached and take control, it was this massive wave of heat that went 
into her chest, tightness, a rash, and then she could start to feel that she was crying. You need to understand how do you react to situations that make you nervous. Write it in the comments. Write it in the comments. Is it a tightness in your stomach? Is it a tightness in your chest? Is it a deep, tense breathing? Is it a rash? Do your thoughts race? What is it that happens to you when you think about going in and talking to your boss about a raise? What is it that happens to you when you think about picking up the phone and calling a prospect in your business? Here's tightness in the chest, uh, crying, shallow breathing, uh, the heat wave comes on, um, my thoughts start to race, my tummy gets upset. Excellent, excellent. These are all physiological responses of your body getting in a state where it's about to pay attention. It doesn't mean that anything's going to go wrong. The problem is when you feel that chest, sweat, stomach drop, um, the shutting down, the nervous belly, when you feel that, you immediately assume something is wrong and you have trained yourself to do one of two things. Shut up or don't show up. That's it. That's it. And what we want you to do is I want you, when, the, when that happens, what I want you to do is go, oh, here's my body. Here's my body sensing something. Just call it out for what it is. And then I want you to slow your body down. I want you to take, and look, here's Row the Realtor. I used the five second rule to ask for a better commission split and I got it, good. Because here's the other interesting piece of science. You know that um, wave that you feel or your tongue gets numb or you get tightness in your cheeks or you freeze? You know when that happens? Based on the science, there is only a 90 second chemical release in your body. It's called the 90 second rule. When your body starts to, stomach starts to flutter, when your heart starts to raise, when you feel this feeling of fear that you have that's unique to you, based on the science, there's a 90 second rule and all of the chemical release that's happening because your body is going into a state of being alert, it only sticks around for 90 seconds as long as you don't let your thoughts race. If your thoughts start to race, you'll start to agitate the situation. I'm going to be talking to you about the connection between worrying and anxiety and how it is critical if you want to quiet your anxiety, if you want to stop worrying, if you want to get control over what you're thinking about. It's going to begin with a habit that you have that somebody else trained you, that you've gotten really good at this habit. And you know what the habit is? It's the habit of worrying. We all do it. We're all guilty of it. We're all um, guilty of, sorry, let me just move that a little bit. We're all guilty of worrying about things that are beyond our control, worrying about things that doesn't matter, worrying about things that we shouldn't care about. Sorry, I've, I've got the streaming lights uh, anymore. Hold on, let me just ask Mandy a question. Um, worrying about all kinds of things that you shouldn't worry about. Um, and it becomes a habit. It becomes a default way of thinking. And so in order to kick off Anxiety Week, I want to explain um, the connection between um, worrying and why that impacts anxiety. And now, since we're talking about anxiety, I have to be very clear about something, okay? I am not a therapist. I am a individual who struggled personally with anxiety for more than two decades. I took Zoloft, which was a lifesaver, and I strongly believe in trying medication when a professional believes that you are so in a hole mentally that medication will give you the ability to start to claw your way out of that hole. Um, I have learned so much about anxiety because of my own struggles. And five years ago, I trained myself to be a deliberate thinker, just like I'm training you to be a deliberate thinker in this program. And through everything that I am about to teach you and all of the, um, all of the, the 
strategies that you're about to learn. I learned all of these by researching anxiety and I road tested them on myself while I was still in therapy. And I then started going off of my medication and as my mindset reset and as my thinking patterns became more positive and stronger and healthier, I was able to completely cure myself of anxiety. And I, I say that with the utmost of relief and confidence. And I have also used, gone on to use these exact same techniques that I'm going to teach you to help my children deal with their anxieties. I've written extensively about anxiety in the five second rule book, which is right behind me. We've sold almost a million copies of that book. It is the number one self-published audio book in the history of Audible. I'm so proud of it. And I speak at length about anxiety and using the five second rule to cure yourself um, of anxiety. Okay. But I need to make it very clear that these training sessions are in no way, no way, a substitute for getting professional help. If you have the kind of clinical anxiety or you suffer from an anxiety disorder, it is paramount that you seek professional help from a therapist one-on-one, -on -one, that you try remarkable um, therapies. Uh, I'm going to say it wrong, but it's uh, EDRM or ERDM, which is the rapid eye movement therapy, incredibly helpful. And so don't be a th hero. Don't go off your meds cold. Don't quit therapy because you think that this live training program is the answer. This live training program is a step. And this live training program for the next week in particular, while we talk about anxiety, you're going to be introduced to tools that are grounded in research and tools that have worked for millions of people and tools that you can take back to your therapist or take back to whatever counseling you get to help you become a deliberate thinker, which will help you quiet your anxiety, get control of it, and then ultimately cure it with the help of a professional if you have an anxiety disorder. So um, that said, please, please, please listen to everything that I'm about to tell you and try it, okay? Please try it because this stuff works if you practice it. And again, quieting anxiety, it's not an event. It's not a one and done. This is a process that you are going to repeat over and over and over again. Because the connection between anxiety and your mindset begins with your habit of worrying. We have a question from Twitter, is worrying the same as overthinking? If you're overthinking about positive stuff and keeping yourself in an excited state, no, it's not. If you're overthinking and the overthinking is you spinning scenarios in your mind that are negative, yes. Overthinking is another word when it's negative for worrying on overdrive. It means that you worry in loops and you keep repeating the worry over and over and over as if you were washing the same load of laundry over and over and over again. And so we're starting with the habit of worrying, worrying about things that don't matter, worrying about things that you can't control, worrying about things that haven't happened yet, worrying about things that are far off in the future. When you start to train yourself to think about things that are not in your control or think about things that are statistically likely never to happen, that is when you can get into trouble. And that's why we're going to start with worrying. You see, worrying is when you allow your mind to default on autopilot and think about things that don't serve you. Think about things that are outside of your control. I'm going to give you an example that's very recent in my life. So I don't know, there were a bunch of you that noticed in the live streams that were on January 6th and January 7th, and I think January 5th, many of you noticed that I had a lot of discoloration on my neck and I had what appeared to be a lump. And my own dermatologist pointed it out to me that I had a lump that was kind of like right here. Now, the second that somebody says lump, what are your, what are your thoughts default to automatically? 
the second somebody says you got a lump on your neck. Cancer, of course. I've got some sort of disease that's going to kill me. And so what do I do when my thoughts go there? Well, then I start touching it and I start poking at it and I start pinching at it. And then I start asking everybody, do you see this lump on my neck? And asking people if they see a lump, that's a proactive action. That's a good idea. But the bad thing to do is to let your thoughts then default to thinking that you have cancer, to thinking that there's something wrong, to thinking that you're going to die, to thinking that this is going to be a major problem, to thinking that there's an emergency right now. And the problem with allowing your thoughts to go that way is because when you start to think about things, first of all, it's outside of my control if this is cancer or not. It's outside of my control right now if this is going to kill me. It's outside of my control right now uh, whether or not a week from now when I go see my doctor, they're going to diagnose what um, is in my neck. Full disclosure, I saw my doctor. There's nothing wrong with me, okay? So if you allow your thoughts to constantly drift to the worst-case scenario, What's going to happen as your thoughts spiral is your body is going to pick up on the fact that your thoughts are negative. Your body's going to pick up on the fact that your brain is worried. And what's going to happen if you allow your thoughts to spiral the way that mine started to about this silly little lump on my neck is that you will start to trigger agitation in your body. So when you start thinking negative things up here, you're going to start feeling negative things in here. You might feel a pit in your stomach. You might actually start to sweat. Your heart might start to race. Your throat might get tight. Your hands might get clammy. These are all telltale signs that you have now crossed from simply worrying in your mind to feeling physical agitation which is anxiety. So that's the relationship between worrying about something, which is thinking negative thoughts about things that are outside your control, and anxiety, which is when those worries become physical agitation in your body caused by your thoughts. That's it. And so it's critical for you, if you have anxiety, if your kids have anxiety, if you're a chronic worrier, if you lay awake at night thinking about all these things that you need to do, we're going to go through all of this and all kinds of things that you can do to start to address this. It is critical that you understand that there is a connection between the day-to-day -day anxiety that many of you feel. We're not talking about anxiety disorders here. We're talking about the day-to-day -day anxiety that you feel that is triggered by the worries in your own head, that is triggered by the overwhelm that you feel in your life. This is anxiety that you can quiet. This is anxiety that you can get control of because this form of anxiety is all triggered by your habit of worrying about things beyond your control. Worrying about whether or not your boss is going to snap at you. Worrying about whether or not your spouse is going to be in a bad mood when you walk in. Worrying about things that um, you can't necessarily control. And so Here's the thing that you want to do. When you have a worry, for example, being worried about a lump in your neck is a good thing because it'll get you to take action. So the second that I confirmed and I looked at the screenshots that many of you sent me and I checked it out in the mirror that I had a little something right here, I made an appointment with my doctor. And then you know what I did for the rest of the week? I practiced the tools that we've already covered in videos 1 through 11. I practice the tools of autopilot versus deliberate thinking. You see, you worry when you're on autopilot. When you direct your thoughts and you're deliberate, you're now in control of what you're doing. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go to Mindset Reset, um, the playlist on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. And on uh, uh, video number two is all about autopilot versus deliberate thinking. So I would catch myself when I'd start to think about the lump. And I would go, nope, I'm not going to worry about that because I can't control it. I'll find out on uh, my doctor's appointment if there's anything that I need to be concerned about. Until then, I'm going to not think about that. I'm going to think about this. 
And so day four, when we talked about thinking this and not that, so this is video number four, I used those tools all this week, everybody, in order to make sure that I didn't allow my habit of worrying about some lump on my neck turn into anxiety that I started to feel in my body. Does this make sense? Give me a thumbs up if this is making sense. And by directing my thoughts, so whenever I'd start to think, oh, there's that lump, there's that lump, and I'd start to touch it again, which of course makes it bigger, um, I would go, wait a minute, hold on, nope, I'm not going to think about this. I'm not going to worry about this. I'm going to be deliberate, and I'm going to think that I'm okay. And I started to train myself to go, I'm not going to worry about it until I have something to worry about. I'm going to make a doctor's appointment, and I will... I will worry about it when there's something to worry about it. But for now, I'm just going to assume that it's totally fine, that there's nothing there, that maybe it's an insect bite or something like that that's gotten inflamed, and that's that. And you know what? It works. It works. And let's say that when I went to my doctor's appointment on Thursday, I got a bad diagnosis. Well, guess what? Then there are decisions to make. Then there are things to be concerned about. I still am going to have to manage my worries because if I start to allow myself to get anxious about a negative situation, I'm going to make it worse for myself, okay? Your anxiety and your worrying doesn't change the things you need to do to address any problem in your life or potential problem. But worrying and causing yourself anxiety will make the potential problem worse because you are going to make yourself feel worse. So it all begins with you and being deliberate about what you will allow yourself to think about and what you will not allow yourself to think about. We are in the middle of anxiety week and I'm super excited about this because I am somebody who has struggled with anxiety for a large part of my life. Um, for more than two decades, anxiety was a chronic and debilitating issue for me. Uh, I have two kids that struggle with anxiety. I know that it is a um, struggle for many of you. There's a documented rise in anxiety. And so we are spending an entire week talking about tools that you can use to understand anxiety, to break apart the thinking habits in your mind, to catch the triggers. And that's what we're talking about today, the triggers that are triggering you to feel anxious before you even realize that it's starting and what you can do with science, particularly something called anchor thoughts to quiet your mind, to settle your body, to stop the agitation and to get control in a moment where normally you would spin out of control. Um, so today we're going to talk about triggers. If you missed yesterday's training, it's very important that you watch it. So on day 13, we talked about the connection between worrying and anxiety and how the habit of worrying about things in the future, things that make you feel uncertain, things that are out of your control, things that, um, things that, uh, you shouldn't worry about it all. Oh, here comes our son. It's uh, seven o'clock in the morning. Sweetheart, I will be done with this training in about 15 minutes, okay? He doesn't look worried at all today. Um, so interesting, that's a trigger for me. So we're talking about triggers today and triggers are, do I know where your phone is? It's in the pocket of my coat that I wore when I tucked you in last night. I'm single parenting it today. So uh, thank you for your patience with the, uh, <laughs> the fact that I needed to help Oakley along. I got to get him to school this morning before I catch a flight to San Francisco. Um, that's a trigger for me, that when something unexpected happens when I'm on a live stream, my stomach immediately gets tight. My thoughts don't go, uh-oh, just yet. My body tenses up. And triggers are a very important thing for you to bring out of the woodwork. And the reason why is there are things that happen to you all day long that trigger tense feelings in your body, that trigger your body to remember situations from your childhood that made you feel out of control or anxious or unsafe. Uh, it's, it's things that happen that um, trigger you to start bracing yourself. And so one of the things that we're going to do now that we've already talked about worrying, 
And we've talked about the connection between worrying and anxiety. And we've talked about the fact that worrying becomes a habit and it's a habit that you need to break. And if you haven't watched that training, just go to YouTube. It's video number 13. And it's all about the connection between worrying and anxiety. Today, we're going to go a little deeper. So yesterday, I asked you to go through your day and start to notice the things that you worry about. And many of you wrote to us and said that the list was long and even seeing the list was overwhelming. That's totally okay. We got to get this stuff out of the dark in order to help you fix it and solve the habit of worrying and teach yourself how to be a much more deliberate thinker. Um, today, let's go a little bit deeper because we did get a question. Um, Danielle, could you put the questions in the... Um, in the text chain because I could not pull up the email this morning that had the the production sheet. Um, we got an email uh, or excuse me a comment that was all about uh, worrying yesterday and I'm not gonna remember it directly but I can paraphrase it. Oh here it is. Uh, Mary Carmen Gamero. May oh wait that's Ma Mary Carmen Gar I'm sorry I'm so all over the place this morning. Thank you for your patience. Um, it's a crazy morning before I, uh, have to get on a plane to San Francisco and I'm doing this alone and, um, I'm a little overwhelmed because the kids are starting to get up, but I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to keep on going. Um, yes, here it is. Thank you. Martha Lester Smith. This all makes so much sense to me, but I'm struggling to, with catching myself in the moment and redirecting. I can often look back and see where and when my mind went to the negative, to the worry, but I don't catch myself in the moment. Any suggestions? Martha, that's not uncommon because the thought pattern of drifting to the future and starting to ruminate and worry about something that's outside of your control or that doesn't matter right now, or an issue or worrying is not going to make an impact. It's such a habit that most of us aren't even aware when our minds are doing it. So this is going to be a new skill. Have patience with yourself. The reason why we're talking about triggers today is because if you have trouble catching yourself in the moment, one of the most effective things that you can do is you can do an audit of your day and you can identify all of the situations, the people, and the time of days or experiences that you have that trigger you to feel uneasy or that trigger you to start to worry or that trigger you to brace yourself. And by going through your day and doing an audit and identifying those moments or times a day where you're tense or where you're on edge or where you anticipate that bad things are going to happen or it's something that you worry about, knowing the triggers in advance gives you a tremendous amount of power because it allows you to pre-plan what you're going to do in response to that trigger. So let me give you an example. I want you today, here's your homework, to go through your day and I want you to go step by step by step from the moment you wake up. When are the moments that you worry? What are the situations that you're in throughout your day that trigger you to be tense. And after you go from the moment you wake up to the moment you get into your bed, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to go and identify, are there people in your life that trigger you to worry? So for example, when you wake up, are worries the first thing on your mind? Does just waking up and thinking about your day trigger worry? If so, write about it. Um, does walking into the kitchen, and eating breakfast, trigger worry. Uh, are you starting a new eating plan and it's overwhelming and you're doubting yourself? Uh, does the idea of getting out of the house, this was one that, that was surprising to me because I don't have this one right now, but in reading so many comments from, from you as you've been sharing your worries and sharing the things that you struggle with, um, just getting out of the house is a cause of major distress for many of you. And if that's you, give me a thumbs up or give us a heart so people know that they're not alone. Um, and that was me when Chris and I were facing all of the major issues that we had uh, 10 years ago, from bankruptcy to alcoholism to fighting nonstop. 
and just starting the day, just getting out of the house, boy, did that make me brace myself because it made me have to face the issues that I was dealing with in my life. Does walking into work cause it for you? Does uh, figuring out what you're going to eat for lunch? Does having to make cold calls? Does the work itself that you have to do in your job, your side hustle, your passion project, the book you need to write, does that create worry and anxiety for you? Does heading home from work create? Does being in the school pickup line and being worried about what your kid, like there are so many moments in your day, a humongous trigger for people is five o'clock at night. Five o'clock at night when the lights start to get dark, major trigger. And the reason why is many of you grew up in households where there was abuse, you witnessed abuse, you had a parent that was an alcoholic, you um, had uh, all kinds of tension in your house. And at five o'clock, what happens is the light starts to change and people start to come home. People start to drink. And that can be a major, major trigger for people. Major, because your body remembers what it was like to be a kid in a household when an alcoholic parent came home. And so your nervous system, believe it or not, is triggered by the time of day and the light changing and the fact that maybe you're with somebody or you live with somebody that comes home and has a drink. And that gets your mind to go. And so today, all I want you to do is I want you to identify the triggers. And here's why. When we pull the triggers out of the dark, we can teach you how to put a plan in place to respond to them so that you're not triggered and going into autopilot and starting to worry and feel anxious and having no control or idea why, okay? And we gotta break these all apart. I haven't lost anybody that I love. So I would not say what I'm about to say if somebody that I loved had died in this pandemic. But I have found the great pause that the last two months have forced me to take to be the greatest gift that I have received in the last decade. My kids have been home. I have been off the road. I have been forced to slow down. I have been reminded of what actually matters, your health, your family, your friends, what you're doing to take care of your mind and your body and your spirit, and making sure that you do something with the time that you have that you really, really enjoy. And the other thing that it's really made me stop and think about is making sure that I'm having fun, that my whole life isn't just work. And it's made me really start to think about the fact that I don't want to go back to the life that I was living before the pandemic hit. How many of you feel that way? That this has been a gigantic mental perspective switch reset button that has, boom, hit you really hard. I want to know in the comments, what is it that you with this new perspective that the pandemic has given you, what is it that you want to change in your life coming out of this? I want to start seeing. I see people saying this has been a wake-up call. I see people saying, yes, this has been a huge shift in my perspective. I see Brianna saying, I want to travel less for work. What do you want? Kelly says she's had a mental switch. Kelly, what? has this pandemic given you in terms of the gift? Heather saying, I wanna ask myself, what do I really wanna do? Kim says, I don't wanna go back to the rat race. Brock says, I wanna start the year uh, excited about it. Uh, I see somebody saying, uh, Larissa says a new business. Uh, Megan says, I want more boundaries. Tara says, I wanna have more fun. What is it that you wanna change given the gift that this pandemic has given you in terms of shifting your perspective. Dinky says, value my friends and family. Uh, Jealous says, take care of my mental health. Spend more time with family. What do you want to change, everybody? Seriously, what do you want to change about your life? 
Is it a relationship? Is it that you have had the time to take care of yourself in small ways and that's giving you greater control in your life? Do you want to change your job coming out of this? Do you want to launch a business coming out of this? Do you want to um, change uh, your timeline for achieving your goals? Is there some project that you want to take on? Because what you're going to hear me say over and over again is that the single most, impro most important project you could ever work on is yourself. And the greatest gift that any challenge will ever give you is a perspective shift and the realization that you can face hard things, that you can survive hard things, and that in learning more deeply about yourself and about what you value through the challenges in life, you are going to be handed a moment where you can make a decision. You hear me say all the time, you're one decision away from a different life. Changing your life does not take motivation. Motivation is garbage. Changing your life takes discipline. The discipline to make a decision to change. You see, you need three things if you wanna come out of this pandemic and truly change your life for the better. So many of you do not wanna go back to the life that you were living. You see something greater for you. And what you're going to need in order to make that shift is you need clarity. You need the clarity to write the change down. And I want you to start right now. What in the comments? Let's get really clear. Terry wants to come out of this a healthier and better person. What is the clarity? Tell me the change that you want to make coming out of this. You gotta have the clarity to write it down. That's number one. The second thing that you got to have in order to make a change happen is you've got to learn the skill of confidence, which is the ability to try something when you don't feel ready. You may not know how to do this change. I see advocate for myself. I see more physical movement. I see I want to change my job. I want to start a business. I want to earn more money. I want to travel less. I want my work to have meaning. I want to get out of an abusive relationship. I want to help people in need. I want to make sure that I continue to keep the promises that I've been keeping, getting up on time, working out every day, working on my relationship. This is fantastic because you're having a moment of clarity. And when you start to write it down, you are starting to develop the confidence and the knowing that you deserve to have this change happen. And then finally, what do you need in order to really change your life? Because it's not motivation, everybody, it's discipline. Discipline to make small promises, keep small promises, discipline to take small actions when you feel afraid, the discipline to find the courage to push yourself forward when you don't know how, that's how you change your life. Just those three things, clarity, confidence, courage. That's all you need. And that's why you got me in your life because I'm here to push you. I'm here to encourage you. And I love seeing what you wanna change. That, oh, I see you need help building confidence. No problem, I got you covered. Because confidence isn't something that you feel. Confidence is a skill. Confidence is the willingness to try because it's through the act of trying, through the act of simply writing down what's the change that you wanna make right there in the comments. Just writing it down and trying it out, trying out writing what that feels like, that's gonna show you that you have the ability to start to express the things that you want and that's the first step to claim these things that you think about. Um, so for those of you, more than a hundred of you, who have written to me in the last week and who have said, I've had a huge perspective shift thanks to this pandemic. And there are some major changes I wanna make in my life. I wanna 
start a women's group. I want to end this relationship that I'm in. I want to stop bashing myself all the time. I want to launch that business I've been talking about. All of the things that you've put on hold. Now is the time to change. So many of you asked me, is it the right time to change your job after a pandemic like this? Absolutely. Because if you don't hear the clarity that's inside you, if you don't quiet the noise and tune into here, if your instincts, if your wisdom, if your knowing, if inside of you, you hear yourself saying, I got to get a new job. I got to get out of this relationship. I don't want to live where I live anymore. I want to be near the water. I want to be in the mountains. I want to be out of the city. I, you have to tune into that stuff. And then it's about confidence and courage to take action. That's it. So I, you know, I'm very open about the fact that I struggled with anxiety for a long time. Yeah. And um, what's interesting about anxiety is that, you know, I'm, I'm now talking to you from the perspective of being 53 years old. I was like really fucked up. And by fucked up, I mean, not that I was like stealing cars or breaking laws or doing anything like that, but I was not comfortable in my own body. And the way that I would describe it is, I think from that moment, literally, that moment in fourth grade that I just shared with you, it makes me really sad to think about the fact that I was just a fourth grader that had, had a traumatic experience. I didn't know, but my nervous system remembered. And so anytime I went to bed, I woke up the next morning with the sensation in my body that something was wrong. And any pattern of behavior or thinking that you start to repeat becomes a habit. Habits are just patterns. It's all that they are. And so I had a life experience because of one incident where I would wake up every single morning and feel like something was wrong and I couldn't put my finger on it. And the more that you wake up and think something's wrong, the more your brain is going to find reasons why something might be wrong. And so I developed this sort of chronic state of feeling on alert, feeling the sense that I got to be aware. Fight or flight. Yes, yeah. yes. My, you know, in, in clinical terms, my sympathetic nervous system got switched on and I had no idea how to turn it off. And if you don't know how to calm your nervous system down to flip off the sympathetic nervous system and flip on the parasympathetic nervous system, which is your calm, grounded, resting nervous system, you will forever struggle with focus, with being present, with the ability to think clearly and make good decisions. You will constantly talk about the fact that you feel anxious and that comes from your nervous system always being on edge and being in fight or flight. I didn't know any of this. I was just a nervous kid with a nervous stomach. Every camp that I went to, I got sent home because I was too homesick. Oh yeah. I mean, I was just, I mean, you know how homesick you have to be for trained counselors to actually call your parents and go, uh, we got a problem here. She can't stay here. Like she is out of her mind. When you say out of your mind, what, what are the physical symptoms or verbal symptoms of that? Oh my gosh. Um, complete dis disassociation. So I would be at camp, like literally sixth grade camp. So at the end of sixth grade year, and I feel, I feel bad for little Mel Robbins. I feel bad for her because, you know, here's this, this experience, sixth grade camp, where the entire school for four nights goes away to a camp, just the sixth grade. It's supposed to be the culmination of your sixth grade year. And I am so freaked out that something bad is gonna happen. That I, of course, escalate things in my own mind. I don't even feel like I'm at camp. I feel like I'm walking on a movie set. I don't feel like I'm on earth. I feel like I'm on a spaceship somewhere looking down all the time. 
I uh, feel like I might throw up because my stomach is rattled because when you're anxious and you can't focus your thoughts, you tend to not eat. And so that, of course, upsets your stomach. It's not that something bad's going to happen. It's that you're screwing up the chemistry in your stomach by not eating because you're so nervous, which only makes it worse. And as your mind is scrambling, thinking something bad is going to happen, and then your stomach is hurting, then you start to think, oh my God, I'm going to throw up. And then you start to think, well, if I throw up, something bad's going to happen. And then the kids are going to laugh. And that, like it just becomes spiral. this spiral train wreck. And that is the state that I lived in. And so, um, you know, you learn how to cope. You It becomes your new normal. But that was basically my life, constantly feeling like something bad was going to happen, constantly feeling like I wasn't really present constantly lying or fibbing about how I felt or what I was thinking because I didn't want people to judge me. I mean, it's awful. And then you come through college and you've got to make that choice in life as to which direction you're going to go in. It's kind of, it seems quite- <laughs> Choice. I love yeah. the choice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is. well, how would you define it? Um, panic. Panic, yeah. Yeah. Because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah. Because I had only ever lived in survival mode. Mm. So did you did you not take a pause to decide to sort of listen take to a pause. who you were and what your your calling was and take uh, a pause. You know. When you have anxiety, mm. your whole mode of living is if I'm on the move, no one can catch me. If I am on the run, I'm safe. And so what's interesting is that I think the only time in my life that I have actually slowed down was during the pandemic. Mm. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, of course. Yeah, you had no choice. <laughs> yeah. And one of the hardest things, which became one of the greatest realizations, is truly coming face to face with myself and realizing that even though I have done all this work to heal trauma, even though I have... Uh, done extraordinary things in terms of my own thinking patterns, that there was a level to which I was still on the run, that I was darting off to a coffee shop or darting off to Target or darting off to an airplane. And all of this racing around kept me from having to truly stop and stand with the woman in the mirror and just be still and figure out, well, what do I really want? How do I really want to feel? So first of all, I literally have struggled with anxiety my entire life. And anxiety for this conversation, the way I define it, is it is the habit of worrying spiraled out of control. You know, you may say that you are a worrier. That's not true. You have a habit of worrying. A habit is a pattern of behavior or thinking that you repeat without realizing it. So anxiety happens when that pattern of worrying about things spirals out of control, and now it starts to marry and manifest itself with physical sensations too. That's all that it is. I know that I say that's all that it is. <laughs> Me personally, I struggled with anxiety, uh, I think my entire life. It became quite acute when I was in my late teens and early 20s. I became medicated in the middle of law school. I took Zoloft for two decades. When our first daughter was born, who is now 17, the postpartum depression, and the cascading panic was so terrible that not only was I medicated and couldn't breastfeed, but I couldn't be left alone with her. Wow. So when I say you can cure yourself of anxiety, I don't say that lightly. Mm. Four years ago, after I had been using the five second rule to change my behavior, how I spoke to my husband, how I negotiate in business meetings, how I conduct sales, the kind of parent that I am, my health habits, my eating habits, curbing the drinking, um, I thought, I wonder if I can use this five, four, three, two, one thing to get control of my thought patterns. Mm. Not my behavior patterns, my thought patterns. Yes, you can. Wow. So we're gonna, we're gonna build this conversation because I wanna start with something we can all uh, relate to and that is how do you stop worrying and how do you stop listening to self-doubt? This is how you're gonna do it. So all day long, you're going to have moments where your thoughts drift. And I use that word on purpose because for me, there is a physical sensation when you start to use the five second rule and you start to wake up, mm. not only on time in the morning, but you wake up to your life and the opportunities in your life. 
there's your thoughts drift. Like you'll just be hanging out with your friends and then suddenly you're like, I'm not sure that that person likes me anymore. <laughs> you know, I haven't heard from my kids lately. I wonder if they're dead or, you know, oh, you know, is what check like you just start worrying about stuff. Mm. Why? Because it's a habit. Because when you're not paying attention, your brain shifts from you being a decision maker and paying attention to you just kind of spinning things on autopilot and one of your habits is worrying. The second you wake up and you notice, holy cow, I'm talking some negative garbage to myself right now. Mm. Five, four, three, two, one. You've just shifted the part of the brain that you're using. You've shifted from the basal ganglia, which is where your habit loops are spinning, and you've awakened your prefrontal cortex. You've also interrupted that pattern. Now what you're going to do, because your mind is actually ready to receive a different thought because of the counting, now you can put in an anchor thought. Like if you have a mantra, if you've got a vision about the way that your business is gonna turn out in five years, if you just have a thought that makes you really happy and proud, insert that. Now, why does this work? It works because of the counting. And I'm not kidding. We know, based on research, that positive thinking alone, not effective. In some instances, trying to force yourself to think positive can actually make the worries worse. Why? Well, the reason why is because it's really hard to just change the channel. What we have to do first is basically interrupt it and turn off the TV and then turn it back on with the prefrontal cortex awakened. So the counting is essential. And so you can start using this today. You catch yourself talking garbage to yourself because we all know if I were to put a speaker on your head and broadcast, <laughs> you'd be sitting here in the audience, you'd be in an insane asylum because the crap that you say to yourself is insane. And the problem is we listen to it. You'll be, you'll be in a sales meeting and you'll be undermining yourself. They're not gonna buy, oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. You're not even present. Five, four, three, two, one, switch it back. Get back to that vision that you have about toasting your success or this customer being really happy or you being proud of yourself. Mm. Whatever that vision may be, you can control your thoughts. And this is not just us talking about it. This is a tool that you can use. So let's take it a step further. So worrying, if you let it go unchecked, what will happen is you will get used to worrying. You will get used to living in a state where you're slightly agitated all the time. Let me talk a little bit about agitation. So what we know based on research is that physically, in your body, so physiologically, being excited is the exact same thing as being afraid. Let me say that again, because it is so important. In your body, being excited is the exact same thing as being afraid. Your body doesn't know the damn difference. Your heart oh, races, heart your really armpits really. sweat, you're like, you know, you may get tight in your throat. You may, your cheeks may get pink like my do when I get excited. The only difference between excitement and fear is what your brain says. And the problem is if you have a habit of worrying, guess what you're gonna tell yourself is going on? That you're, that you're like freaking out that you're not excited, that something must be wrong. Oh gosh, why would you say something's wrong? Because you got a habit of saying that all the time. Even as I became a, a speaker for a living or I'd be on CNN, when I first started doing it, I would be freaking out backstage. But even, even though, like, you know, just, a couple, just last week, standing backstage, about to go on, 8,000 people, heart races, armpit sweat, mm. you know, my hands get clammy. I'm not nervous though, not at all, I'm excited. And so I developed this technique and research uh, out of Harvard, not based on my technique, but something very similar, proves that if you basically, right before you're about to do something, take a test, run a race, public speaking, a business negotiation, ask somebody to marry you, whatever it may be that gets your heart racing, just do this. Go, I'm excited. I'm excited to give that speech. I'm excited to ask him or her. I'm excited to do this race. I'm excited. Because what happens is you give your brain context so your brain doesn't escalate the stuff going on mm. in your body. Your brain's not worried. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can combine this with the five second rule. So we know how to do worrying. You, ca you catch your thoughts drift, five, four, three, two, one, anchor thought. If you start to feel your heart racing, five, four, three, two, one, to awaken the prefrontal cortex and then start going, I'm really excited to do this. I'm really excited to do this. Another technique that you can use is ask, um, 
I think they call it interrog interrogatory questions, mm -hmm. where instead of giving yourself a pep talk, say, well, why am I ready to do this? Why am I ready? Because that'll force you to answer the question, which then convinces you. Mm -hmm. So why am I ready to close the sale? Why am I ready to give this speech? Why am I ready? So those are two strategies that you can use back by science that are proven to actually make your performance be much better. Now let's take it a step further to anxiety. So anxiety is what happens when the habit of worrying spins out of control, your body gets really agitated, and then you allow your mind to escalate it mm. into a full-blown panic attack. So for those of you that have not had the pleasure of having a panic attack, <laughs> Let me um, explain what it's like. So have you ever been in your car and you're driving down the road and you go to change lanes and all of a sudden there's like, oh my God, there's a car right there, yeah. right? And you swerve a little bit and then your heart's like and you may sweat a little bit and, and you grip the wheel really tight and you're super locked in on, on the road ahead of you. Mm. But then that car pulls away and the, the, the near miss scenario passes and your mind starts going, okay, you're all right now. Right. You're all right now, that's it. That's all, that's what a panic attack is, only it happens while you're standing in front of your coffee pot. <laughs> Seriously, you have that same, oh my God, way behind that. And your heart's racing and, and the problem for your brain is that your brain can't look around and say, holy cow, we almost got hit by a car. Right. Your brain's saying, what the hell is wrong with her? She's making coffee and she's freaking out. And so now your brain is a problem because what's your brain's job? It's designed to protect you. Mm. So your brain will now do whatever it can to magnify the problem. Remember we talked about the spotlight effect? It'll start telling you all kinds of crazy stuff because it can't figure out contextually what the hell's going on. She's just making coffee, now her heart is racing and she's breathing really. Holy cow, maybe she is having a heart attack. Mm. A lot of people that have panic attacks say, I think I'm dying, oh my God, what's, what's happening? Wow. Or you'll see them do the deer in the headlights thing where they gotta get out of the room. That is the spotlight effect in your brain, now taking control and magnifying everything to get you out of whatever it was. So here's how you use the five second rule. You use it to stabilize your thoughts before the panic escalates. And then what happens is it drifts into worry and then it disappears. Right. So the second you feel worry, you catch it, you train yourself to do that. If you start feeling yourself getting, you know, your heart racing, you can five, four, three, two, one and use the I'm excited, I'm excited. Um, if you, if that doesn't work, literally five, four, three, two, one, and just give yourself an anchor thought, literally, of you being okay. Anxiety always begins with a worry, always. It begins with a thought that is triggered by something. So if you suffer from anxiety, you wake up in the morning and your mind spins, you lay in bed at night and your mind spins, you walk into work and you feel anxious in your body, Interestingly, another major trigger is being home or going home and that moment right before your partner walks in the door. If you feel anxious when your partner's about to walk in or you're about to walk into your own home, that is a major signal that you are in the wrong relationship, that there is something incredibly off and you either need to get into counseling, but that is one that we hear a lot about. Wow. Um, because you're walking into a situation mm. that feels uncertain. Yeah. A lot of people, by the way, had parents that were abusive or parents that were yellers. So they also are experiencing ghosts from the childhood yeah. of it's five o'clock, dad's about to come home and pour a drink and everybody's on edge. Yeah. So write down the triggers, okay? Because having, tr having kind of the triggers ahead of time will help you come up with a plan for how you're going to catch yourself when your mind defaults to the automatic ways that it thinks. Then what I want you to write down next to the trigger is what exactly are you worried about? So having the trigger and then the, what do I worry about? I worry that my boss is gonna yell. I worry that my partner's gonna yell. I worry that I'm gonna get in trouble. I worry that um, you know my friends are gonna laugh at me. I worry that I'm gonna be a, th whatever the f it may be. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna write down what I call an anchor thought. An anchor thought is something that weighs you down and it makes you excited. And so here's how the strategy works with the five second rule. The next time you're in a situation, and let's just use the example of pulling into your own driveway or your own apartment, and maybe you've got issues with your boyfriend or girlfriend or your roommate, and that makes you unsettled. 
you're, the second you pull in and you feel the trigger, you're going to go five, four, three, two, one, because I want to interrupt your mind from going into the I don't like what, what if it, blah, blah. and then you're going to drop in the anchor thought of the last time that you and your roommate really got along well or the last time that you stood up for yourself and it went fine and or you're your gonna, puppy yeah or a puppy or whatever <laughs> and you're going to say i'm so excited to deal with this yeah and then you're going to get out of your car even though your body is going to feel a little unsettled and your mind's going to raise go five four three two one if you start to like be like uh but what uh, uh, and then walk in the door and what I'm teaching you to do is to not let your mind hijack you. Right. And it's very important because there's a very tight nexus between your habit of worrying and spiraling your thoughts and the way your body starts to amp up. And so we want to settle your mind so we don't agitate your body. You got it? Yeah. And so if you start to practice that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, and for you 18-year-olds that are watching this, use this with the nerves that you have about what you're going to do with your life. Use this when you catch yourself worrying about college applications because worrying about the applications won't get them done. Worrying about what your friends are doing won't make it happen. Worrying about what you're going to be doing when you're 25 or how you're going to make money, it's not going to help you make money right now. It's only going to make you miserable. Right. So five, four, three, two, one, cut off that habit. Yeah. That'll stabilize your body and then go to a vision of you at the age of 25 driving a car that you think is cool and hanging out with a friend that's cool and saying to yourself, I'm so excited because I know I'm going to figure it out. Because you don't need to worry about that right now. Yeah. But it becomes a habit that destroys your year this year. Do you feel like you worry too much? Do you feel like you live in your head too much? Do you wish that your mind was a more positive place? You know, my daughter and I are here in Miami and I'm just like you. My mind can be my worst enemy. I was laying in bed last night and I had fallen asleep and I kept waking up. And you know what I was thinking about? I was waking up because I could hear people in the hallway kind of coming in from a late night of partying. And you know what the first thing that my mind defaulted to? There being a fire in the hotel. And I started having these visions of my daughter and I going down the stairwell and getting trapped. And then I had visions of us being on the balcony uh, on this room and fire kind of engulfing. And what are we doing? Are we tying a rope? Which, I mean, it's just insanity, absolute insanity. And I, I use the techniques that I teach you. I went five, four, three, two, one. I am not thinking about this. And the thought disappeared because I constantly reset my mindset. And, you know, one of the reasons why I'm telling you this is if you are tired of feeling negative, if you feel often that your own thoughts are the things that trip you up in life, that you wish that your mind were more positive, I'm telling you that I'm the same way. Just because I teach this stuff, just because I study this, just because I do what I do for a living doesn't make me immune to what it means to be human. And what it means to be human is that your brain and your body want you to survive. Your brain and your body remember situations that scare the daylights out of you. Your brain and your body try to talk you out of anything that makes you feel risky. And your brain, given that it has been um, trained by situations in the past and given that you allow it to worry all the time, you have a habit of doing it, if you're not careful and you're not deliberate, your brain will default to scary crap like mine was last night. That doesn't mean you're broken. It means that your brain is thinking something that's broken and it's time for you to reset your mindset and pull it back. And today's coffee talk is all about feeling the fear and doing it anyway. And I'm sure you've heard that statement, right? Feel the fear. And the thing that I want to talk to you about today is that there is not only a lot of inspiration behind that statement, feel the fear, but there's also a lot of science behind it. And that's what we're going to talk about today, that if you want to get through and break through your fears that are holding you back, you're going to need to learn to feel the fear and do it anyway. Um, you know, yesterday, I also want to just say that we talked about, um, oh no, it wasn't yesterday. Was it yes? Did we go live yesterday? I'm having a hard time uh, remembering what's going on in my life because I've been on the road 
uh, since Sunday. I'm now in Miami. Yesterday, we talked about living your passion, and a lot of you were confused about where to turn in your life if you don't know um, how to live with more passion. A lot of you keep saying you want to find your passion, and so I want to remind you about the fact that if you missed yesterday's training, it's a really important one about the definition of passion because passion is something that's in you. It's something that you unlock. It's something that you release. It is not something that uh, you go and find outside of you. It's something you tap into inside of you. If you missed that training, make sure you go to Facebook or go to YouTube and um, you can watch that training in full. It's a super, super, super important one. But today we're going to be talking about feel the fear, because what you're going to learn today is that we tend to think about fear as something that's up here, you know, that the fears are all in our heads. Well, the truth is your body feels fear and remembers fear and senses fear way before your mind does. And the reason why I want to talk to you about this is because as many of you know, we have a brand new audiobook that just launched with Audible Originals. So Audible Originals is an imprint inside of Audible. We are a major partner of Audible's and we just released a brand new audiobook. It's their number one new release on Audible called Take Control of Your Life, How to Silence Fear and Win the Mental Game. And there were some unbelievable things that I learned and that my team learned and that we're now sharing with you in doing that project. So Take Control of Your Life isn't your typical audiobook. It's not me just reading a book that I wrote. What Take Control of Your Life is, is Take Control of Your Life is a live coaching and takeaway program that's 10 hours long. And so there are six people that you meet when you listen to Take Control of Your Life. And they have fears, just like you have fears, fears that are holding them back, just like you have fears that hold you back, fears that impact your life in a negative way. And we go session by session for six sessions. You listen to the coaching session. You hear about somebody else's fear. You hear me coaching this person live. And then I spend like 45 minutes unpacking the entire coaching session for you. And on top of it, you guys, there's a 55 page workbook that our team designed that goes along as a companion to this audiobook. And you don't even need to buy the audiobook to get the workbook or to get the takeaways because I'm giving you the takeaways for free here on our live stream. So if you want the audiobook, just go to melrobbins.com slash take control and you can download the audiobook. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is I'm going to talk to you about the session that we did with Heather in Take Control of Your Life. And it's a really incredible um, session because Heather um, is held back at work because what happens is when she has to have a really difficult conversation, when there's something that she wants to talk to her boss about, when there's a conflict with one of her colleagues, you ever have a conflict with your colleagues at work? Ever feel like you work in a toxic work environment? Well, this is something that you need to understand. Sometimes the toxicity in your work environment is about the other people. And sometimes the toxicity in your work environment or in your life environment or your friend environment is about stored memories in your body from your childhood. I know it's crazy stuff because the saying, feel the fear and do it anyway, it's true because your body feels situations that set you, uh, that put you in a state of being afraid before your mind catches up and starts thinking about what you're afraid of. And so one of the key takeaways from Take Control, and one of the things that I want to teach you today, is that if you start to tune into your body, and you start to notice the signals that your body is sending to you in your day-to-day -day life, signals like butterflies in your stomach, signals like feeling a rush of energy up to your neck, signals like your armpit sweating, signals like your hands getting sweaty, signals that your body is stepping and noticing a situation that reminds it of your past. Learning how to read those signals that, oh my God, here goes my body. My body is starting to recognize that this is a situation that puts me on edge. Recognizing those signals first 
and slowing the body response down before your brain starts to go, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. That is a critical skill in taking control of your life. What is one thing that you know that you need to do that when you think about doing it, and a lot of times it's a conversation, when you think about doing it, you get a pit in your stomach. I want you to write in the comments, what is that thing that you uh, are afraid to do? You know you should do it. It's probably a conversation. And, oh, here we go. My 29-year-old son came home. He's living with us temporarily. He's bringing women home late night from the bars. He's a lot like his father, so very confrontational. Having that conversation gives you a pit. Um, starting writing my book, having a conversation with my coach, leaving my home, driving, asking for my raise that I'm worth, quitting my job, calling that prospect in my business, paying my taxes, paying my bills, working out in front of other people, doing a presentation. These are all driving to another state in busy traffic, um, reaching out to new clients. Excellent. Opening up a business. So as you think about this thing that you want, what immediately happens is you feel a pit in your stomach. That's what happens before your mind even goes, oh, I'm scared to call prospects. Oh, I'm scared to leave a secure job. Oh, I'm scared to write this new script. Oh, I'm scared to lose weight. Before you, I'm scared to address the issues in my marriage. I'm scared to talk to my husband about money. I'm scared to stand up for myself. I'm scared um, to act as I feel I should because I'm scared about the negative consequences. Your brain doesn't even process it yet. What happens is you have an idea about this thing that you know you need to do and you immediately feel a pit in your stomach or you feel your chest tighten or you feel energy rise up into your neck, right? Your body is feeling the fear first. And believe it or not, part of the self-awareness and self-mastery and the ability to move your life forward is not only in 54321 finding the instant motivation and courage to push yourself forward, but the true liberation and freedom is going to come when you start to understand the body signals that got programmed a long time ago, long time ago in your body that are holding you back and learning how in those moments when you get a pit in your stomach to recognize it and slow the body sensations down and then move forward before your mind starts talking you out of it. So a lot of what happens for us is you had situations when you were a kid, maybe your mom or your dad were really intense. Maybe you grew up in a very competitive household. Maybe you um, were the kind of kid that things were better in your house when you were seen but not heard. And so any, and your body remembers it. Your body remembers situations when your parents were yelling because as a kid, it feels traumatic. Your body remembers situations where in a classroom you were nervous or afraid to be called out or be seen. Your body remembers moments when you were embarrassed. And so what's interesting is that um, your body will now face any situation where you're about to be seen or you're about to speak up or you're about to do something where you're facing uncertainty or you're about to um, face judgment and your body remembers those situations and it starts to get nervous or agitated or on edge because it knows, oh my God, you're about to do something that's going to expose you and your body wants to keep you safe. That's why your stomach starts to go grumbly. That's why your chest starts to get tight because you are about to do something that exposes you. You're about to do something that is new. You're about to do something that is scary and your body wants to try to protect you. Now your body's misreading the situation by the way. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.